Hello everyone. My name is Quincy Cortuel. I cover Missouri men's basketball from Maine here. I also enjoy college basketball. And today, I am going to give you all some tips on how to make very smart and intelligent picks in your Mark Madness bracket. However, I understand some of you may not know what March Madness is or how to fill out a bracket, which is totally fine, so I'll show you how. I also understand that some of you may already know what you're doing, so if you do, please skip to this part of the video. Okay, for those who are still here, March Madness. It is the Super Bowl of college basketball that spans multiple weeks starting in late March and ends in early April when a champion's crown. It is a 64 team six round single elimination tournament. If you win, you move on to the next round. If you lose, you're out. That way, Kelsey got it, touchdown! The teams are split up into four sections. Whoa, this is only one region, but this I think encapsulates the idea of a bracket. The best teams are seated first, and the worst teams are seated 16th. Now, how to fill out a bracket. We'll use last year's since this year's hasn't been released at the time of this recording. So here we have one seeded Gonzaga playing 16th seeded Georgia State. If you think Gonzaga is going to win, you'd put them in the next round like this. If you think Georgia State is going to win, you do the same thing, except you put Georgia State on the next line instead of Gonzaga. You repeat the process for every single matchup on this bracket until you have a champion, whoever that may be. All right, now that we've got that down, tip. Number one, try not to pay that much attention to seeding when making your March Madness picks. One thing I want to avoid here is telling you to pick teams solely based on seeding. For example, it is very common advice to pick a 12 seed to beat a 5 seed. And it makes sense because of the history of the matchup. Since the modern day tournament format was adopted in 1985, there have been 37 March Madnesses, only five of them. I've seen all four of the five seeds advance past the first round. Or even something like the teams you pick to go to the final four. Some people might say, oh, the seeds of your final four teams should be at least 10. And again, history does back up that claim. So for example, last year we had one seeded Kansas, two seeded Villanova, two seeded Duke, and eight seeded North Carolina. So one plus two plus two plus eight is... Thirteen, thirteen. The combined seeds of the final four teams last year was thirteen. But here's the thing. Every year is different. We've had a year where two 15 seeds won their first game. In 2012, Lehigh, led by future NBA superstar CJ McCollum, knocked off Duke, and Norfolk State upset Missouri. Last year, a 15 seed made the Elite Eight for the first time ever. We've also had multiple years where not a single 12 seed or lower won a game. Regarding the Final Four in the National Championship, we've had a year where all the one seeds made it to the Final Four. We've had a year where the seeds of the Final Four participants added up to 26. We've had years where two one seeds met in the National Championship game, but we've had a year where the last two teams standing were a seven seed and an eight seed. You shouldn't say, oh, I think this 12 seed is going to beat this five seed because at least one 12 seed beats a five seed all the time. No. The reason you should pick a 12 seed to beat a five seed is because you actually think that 12 seed can win. You see, with seeding, the bracket is picked and sorted by humans who are naturally imperfect creatures. People that make the brackets are far from perfect evaluators. Some teams will get seeded too high, other teams will get seeded too low. So please, please, please do not let the number next to a team's name influence your picks all that much. Like, for example, think of any sports draft, the NFL draft, the NBA draft, a fantasy football draft, not once in the lengthy history of literally any sports draft have the pre-draft rankings, which are made by humans, been exactly correct. That has never happened before. 
Mark Madness eating is a similar way. So let's start with upsets, because those are fun. What should you, yes, you, look for in an underdog? Or what is colloquially known as a Cinderella? Number one, experience. A lot of underdogs that succeed in March are very old. Leonardo DiCaprio would not like this. Last season, 12-seeded Richmond upset 5-seeded Iowa. Six of Richmond's top seven scorers were seniors, and their leading scorer was a junior. In 2014, 14-seeded Mercer shocked 3rd-seeded Duke. Their top five scorers were all seniors, and the only two freshmen the Bears had on the roster played a combined 42 minutes the entire season. But even higher-seeded underdogs fall into this category, because underdog means team that is not supposed to beat their opponent. For example, 11 seeded Loyola Chicago went all the way to the Final Four back in 2018. Five of their seven leading scorers were upperclassmen. Looking deeper into college basketball history, 2002 Missouri, 2006 George Mason, 2011 VCU, 2013 Wichita State. A lot of these lower seeds that made the Elite Eight and beyond were largely made up of non-freshmen. Underdogs are like wine. The older, the better. Why is this? Think of just being a student in high school or college. Upperclassmen know how to do high school or college better than freshmen because juniors and seniors have had several years of school under their belt. Teams with more experience likely have higher chemistry. They've been playing with each other for a long time. They've usually spent multiple years refining their game at a Division I level. So when these teams get to march and play in games that matter the most, they likely know what they're doing because they have likely been there before. The second thing I want you all to look out for is style of play. There have been plenty of instances where a team was not as talented as their opponent, but they defeated them because of the way they played basketball. Exhibit A can be seen with Oral Roberts a private evangelical institution in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with less than 4,000 undergrads. They not only took down two-seeded Ohio State, who had multiple future pros on their team, but also defeated seven-seeded Florida, and were this close to becoming the first 15 seed to ever advance to the Elite Eight. Now, how did they do it? Well, for one, they were actually pretty good. They had Max Asmus, who led all of college basketball in scoring that season, so that certainly helped, but, a lot of it had to do with the way they played basketball. In order for a David to take down a Goliath, David has to do something semi-unconventional in order to take down Goliath. A team with a roster that is inferior to their opponent must find some extraordinary way to win, to succeed. They can't play a normal motion offense or run a conventional man-to-man -man defense. They have to get a little tricky. They have to find some roundabout way to succeed. For example, if I had to wrestle John Cena one-on-one, -on -one, I'd have to find some sort of out-of-the-box way to take him down. I can't use traditional wrestling tactics against Cena or else I would probably snap in half. In basketball, that usually involves one of these following few things. Playing up tempo shooting and making a lot of plays, forcing a lot of turnovers, limiting mistakes, creating extra scoring opportunities, including free throws, and generally being extra aggressive and taking a lot more risks than a normal team would. Oral Roberts was exactly that, especially relative to their opponent. And lo and behold, look at how these little Golden Eagles conquered the big, bad Buckeyes. They took 12 more threes than Ohio State and made six more than the Buckeyes. They forced 16 turnovers while only committing six themselves. They had 10 steals compared to just two for the Buckeyes, and they made five more free throws than Ohio State. There have also been instances where a great defensive underdog shut down a favorite because they, well, they played great defense. A perfect example is Abilene Christian in 2021, who was not just a 14 seed. They were one of the best defenses in college basketball who forced the most turnovers per game. Held three seeded Texas to 52 points and forced 22 Longhorn turnovers while only committing nine themselves en route to an upset. 
14 seeded Stephen F. Austin did the exact same thing to West Virginia in 2016. They forced 22 Mountaineer turnovers while only committing six themselves. They also shot and made a bazillion free throws. So contrasting styles of play, extreme styles of play is something you really want to look out for when picking an underdog. However, this isn't just the case for lower seed and underdogs. This doesn't exclusively apply to like 12, 16 seeds. For example, Auburn made the Final Four in 2019 as a five seed, which isn't all that common, but the one really special thing about them was that they were one of the best three-point shooting teams in the nation that season, and it showed in the biggest games. They buried fourth-seeded Kansas and top-seeded North Carolina on their way to Minneapolis with a combined 33 pointers against those two teams, which is kind of a lot. Last thing on Cinderella's, do not be fooled by the sexy upset pick. Seemingly every year, there is at least one double-digit seed, usually a mid-major, that an alarming amount of people pick to win their first game. They pick them because, I don't know, it makes them look cool and niche and hipster, I guess. And a lot of people are going to tell you to pick this team. That team is going to be staring at you from across the room looking at you all promiscuously. And they're gonna say something like, Hey. Pick me. I know you want me. And your job is to actually look into why that team has become so popular. A perfect example of this was South Dakota State last season. They were a 13 seed that so many people picked to pull off an upset. In ESPN's tournament challenge, 31.2% of users predicted a Jackrabbit victory. For context, Marquette, who was a nine seed, means that they were playing an eight seed, an even matchup, Marquette was picked by just 33.7% of users. That should not be happening. Well, for one, South Dakota State dominated their conference. They went 18-0 in Summit League play, and 12 of those wins were by double digits, including a conference championship victory. Also, the team they were playing, Providence, was just really boring. Like, they didn't have a super recognizable star. Their style of play wasn't very fun or interesting. They were coming off of a 27-point blowout loss to Creighton in the Big East Tournament, so people's lasting image of them wasn't too positive. But there were a few key things that people really glossed over. One was that Providence was actually a pretty good team. They ended the regular season with just four losses, and two of them were close defeats against ranked Villanova. And they were pretty good at defending the three-pointer, which leads into my next point. When South Dakota State shot less than 35% from three that season, AKA when they weren't blistering hot from downtown, they were three and five, including an eventual loss to Providence that saw the Jackrabbits shoot less than 31% from three. Now, if the background check checks out, and that team that is being picked at an alarming rate to pull an upset actually seems like a team that could win, then by all means, pick them. All I'm suggesting is that you first do your research. And that is a sentiment I think all of you should apply in every facet of your life. Now it is time to talk about a team you should be wary of. And this applies to all seeds, especially the higher seeded ones, the ones that are upset over. You want to be cautious of teams that have major flaws, and that usually involves just being plain bad on either offense or defense. Regarding teams that are defensively deficient, Iowa in 2021 is a perfect example. Their offense was amazing. They were led by Wooden Award winner Luca Garza. They were one of the highest scoring teams in college basketball that season, and they were genuinely a super fun team to watch. But you want to know why they didn't make it out of the round of 32? They gave up 95 points to Oregon. Missouri in 2012 is another good example of this. They had put together one of the most memorable seasons in program history. 30 wins, Big 12 champions, one of the best offenses in all of college basketball, but they had a not so great defense. Some teams that I think have great offenses, but very flawed defenses, I would suggest Gonzaga, I would suggest Arizona, I would suggest Iowa and Xavier too. All of those teams, amazing offenses. Top 15 in offense, all of these teams, I believe, in Ken Palm. But very exposable defensively, and again, that is not what you want come March. 
and some teams that I think have really, really good defenses, but not amazing offenses. Rutgers, Tennessee, Iowa State, Virginia. So with all eight of these teams behind me, they have one exposable flaw, whether it's offensively or defensively. And let's say, for example, a team like Tennessee gets matched up against a team that plays very fast and shoots a lot of threes and plays really, really extra aggressive, that's where you might want to consider picking against them in the first round. Or, if you get a team that has a very poor defense, I would suggest picking against them more in the later rounds. Okay, now, who should you pick to go far? Let's take the catches. One, similar to how underdogs pull off upsets, experience. Two, these teams with balance and depth. Teams where it's not just one or two guys carrying the load. Missouri this year is actually a perfect example of that. Six different players have scored 20 or more points in a game for the Tigers, which is a lot, and that's great. And third is good coaching. I feel like that one is kind of self-explanatory. Okay, and finally, who should you pick to win the whole thing? If you do an electronic bracket through ESPN, Yahoo, CBS, the national champion and the final four, they are weighted the most. Picking the national champion, if you get that right, that is worth about as much as picking the entire first round correctly. It is worth a lot. Now, I know I said earlier that seeding shouldn't matter a whole lot when you pick the teams. I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit here. So since 1985, 32 out of the 37 tournaments that have been played have seen a top three seed win the whole thing. That is a lot. Also, the reason I'm contradicting myself and recommending that you do pick a top three seed to win the whole thing is that their path is a lot easier than, let's say, a 7, 8, 9, or 10 seed. Remember, getting the national championship right is everything. All right, my final tip, be different. In order to do well amongst your friends when picking your bracket, you need to do something different with them. For example, over 27% of ESPN tournament challenge users picked Gonzaga last season to win the national championship. Again, guess which people scored the highest on the brackets? You guessed it, the ones that picked Kansas. Also, know the people in your bracket group. If you're in a group of 10, for example, and six of them are irrational Texas fans, wouldn't be a terrible idea to have Texas lose a little early. All right, that's gonna do it for me today. If you made it this far, I appreciate you, I love you, ventricles and all, go fill out that bracket, and happy March!